Hey, Smart Pack fans, I'm Smart Packer Dan. She's Dr. Lydia Gray, Smart Pack staff veterinarian and medical director. And we are here to answer your horse health questions asked and answered and voted by you. I'm answering. Oh, right. That's okay. I'm not answering. It's like you've never done this before. <laughs> Which brings up a great point. Some of you who watch the series might be wondering what I'm doing here. So Smart Packer Sarah is actually out on maternity leave. She just gave birth to her first child a few weeks ago. Yeah. So we're so excited for her. Yeah. I'm wondering, how long do you think till Sarah has her new baby ride a horse? Oh, um, I'm going to say on top the horse. Ooh, okay. In the first year? Is, first, that, is I, that bad? No, I feel like that's probably... Maybe two years. Two years, okay. 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 When it happens, we want photos though, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> But also in addition to this month, and something else new that we're doing, okay. we've added voting to our YouTube community oh, right, tab, right, right, which right. is super exciting. We got so many great responses, thousands, which we are actually going to reference a couple of them here in this video. So make sure to keep watching towards the end. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> um, but with that being said, do you want to get started with the questions? Let's do it. All right. So the first question was asked by Emily on the blog at blog.smartpack.com. Okay. She asked, in the event of a natural disaster, such as a fire, mm -hmm. hurricane, or flood, where you don't have much notice before yeah. having to evacuate, what do you like having packed in your trailer? We live in Southern California where we could be forced to leave due to a fire with little to no warning. We're trying to decide what past ownership papers and health records we should keep in the trailer at all times in case of an emergency. Ooh. Yeah, so that was a very specific question, yeah. right? but a good one. But I would like to open it up a bit more to like disaster preparedness in general because September is National Preparedness Month. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. And as we're filming this today, mm -hmm. as we're recording it, um, the Hurricane Florence is about to hit the coast. Yes. So this is a very timely topic. Um, not going to be out in time for those people, but I think that what we're going to say today is going to help others because they mentioned fires, there's tornadoes, there's Absolutely. floods, there's earthquakes, I mean there's a lot of stuff. One of the things that you have to know, the, the first thing I guess is um, some disasters can happen anywhere, like a barn fire, mm -hmm. all right? But then others can happen, they only happen in certain parts of the country. So like where I live, we don't get hurricanes. Lucky. We don't get wildfires. But So you have to know what happens in your area because um, that determines what your response will be. Will you evacuate? Will you reach high ground? Will you go to, do you leave your horses in the barn or uh, turn mm. them out? Yes, that's a common it's question. It's a very common question ask. and you have to ask yourself that all the time and it depends what your threat is in your area. Um, the one thing I wanted to say when I did this, when I was in more involved in the horse rescue community, I, I learned the definitions. So an emergency is an urgent situation. Okay. A disaster is an emergency that overwhelms the individual mm. and even the local resources. So like your fire department, please. Right, so that's why we call hurricanes disasters because the whole coast is affected and there are people coming in to help from all over the country. Okay. So that's a disaster, but an emergency is a very local, like one person or one building. One barn building. is affected yeah, exactly. or something Exactly, that's like an emergency, that. yeah. So um, the other thing we're gonna do at the end of this or at some point is uh, provide you with links to no. places to go. So I, I can't cover everything that you need to know for a disaster in this little segment. So we're gonna share some links with you. And those are the places I went to to get this information because I wanted to be super timely and accurate and, and all that. Um, and it's, it's, it's gonna be links to, for people, for horse people, mm -hmm. as well as for you yourself, like ready.gov. Have you been? I have not. That's, yeah, that's where people go to find out bring batteries and water and. So clearly I'm not prepared even for my not, own situation. You're not, yeah. <laughs> well, the surveys say that um, anywhere from 40 to 60% of Americans aren't prepared for disasters. Mm. Well, no one wants to think about that. And that's one of the reasons that people sort of procrastinate is, yeah. is it can't happen to me and, and all that. So would you recommend going onto these links and maybe like printing out some information just to have on yes. hand? Yes, yes, okay. yes. And Red Cross now has an app. Oh. And you pick, they have, well, they have lots of apps that, and you pick the disaster, the threat that's in your area. Okay. So you can choose a hurricane app or a flood app or a wildfire app and it tells you exactly what to do for each situation. That's super helpful. Yeah, that's Red Cross. So we'll put those links up for you, but just some, some general things. Um, so it's clear that being responsible for a large animal like a horse is very different 
from having a dog or a cat. Yes. And you have to plan ahead. And so one of the things that, that I really wanted to make sure I said today was, you know, you for a horse you have to have a trailer. You can't just toss them in your car. And so you have to make sure you, um, if you have a trailer that it's functional, mm -hmm. you've kept it maintained and serviced. And also that your, your truck, your tow vehicle, is gassed up and it's also mm. maintained and serviced. You can't go out to a trailer that's been rotting or rusting and sitting there and you don't even know if it's hitchable to give the right connections. You gotta practice that stuff. It's gotta be in working order. And this is the really important part, your horse has to load. Yes. You can't be facing an emergency of like a mandatory evacuation and you haven't loaded your horse. He's been on the property for 10 years and never seen the inside of a trailer. Not the time to teach trailer training. No, no. So it's just like fire drills in schools, mm -hmm. right? Um, you practice these things so that when the, if it happens, you're ready. Uh, if you don't have a trailer, then this is where you establish a sort of a partner or a buddy system mm -hmm. with another barn or even a, a border. And you arrange for, if there's 10 horses on your farm, that there are enough vehicles for all 10 horses to go. Mm. You might only get one trip. So already have planned out which horse is gonna trailer with which other horse yeah. and where they're gonna go. Yep, and practice it. Because it sounds, it might sound easy, but until you do it and you find out that, oh, we don't have enough halters or we don't have enough lead ropes or you don't know till you, till you try it. So there's a lot to think about. And these websites we're gonna give you will have lists and things mm. to, to mention. So that um, one thing you, you print out in addition to those lists are the evacuation maps. Oh. Know where you're gonna go. Okay. Because the communication might be down. Your phone might not be working. Electricity power might be out. So with the horse though, there's only so many places you can take a horse. They're mm -hmm. not a dog, they're mm -hmm. not a cat. Mm -hmm. You have to have like another large structure to put right. them in. Right, right. And so some of those places are um, racetracks, fairgrounds, um, show facilities, equestrian centers, stock yards or auction places. It, depending, get to know your, um, your emergency authorities in your area. Okay. So it could be the county sheriff, it could be um, animal control, humane societies. There's, there's different people who are in charge of uh, what happens in an emergency or disaster. Know them and they'll tell you where you're supposed to go with your horse. And that's why you should have, now I should probably answer the question, <laughs> you should have your horse's medical records and paperwork with you because some places won't let you on without a current Coggins and proof of current up-to-date vaccinations. Oh, wow. Yeah. So those are two things you must have in some sort of watertight, waterproof envelope. And they even say, have this information um, in your trailer, like the person asked, but also have it somewhere else, mm. off-site. Well, I know a lot of vets are like emailing their Coggins now to you, mm -hmm. so can you have that as a? Well, yes, because then you can access it from your phone if your phone <laughs> works, but it's best to have a printed out copy. Mm. And also, you might have lots of photos on your phone of your horse, print out some so that you have a paper copy of a photo. That will help you for proof of ownership if you have to go find your horse or that are, they're at a facility and there's lots of horses and you say the brown one and well, there's lots of brown ones. Um, but the, so the Coggins and the vaccination history, if there's something in your horse's history, he's on medications, he has a special diet, those things are handy to have. But the, the proof of ownership, any um, registration papers mm -hmm. or breed registry, that's important to have. Um, and then it comes to identifying your horse. Yeah. There, yeah. 27 brown horses. Oh my gosh. So there are ways to permanently identify. They'd be like um, microchipping would be phenomenal. Right? Oh, that's, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, tattooing, branding. Um, then you can, you can uh, there's fetlock bands, there's neck collars. You can put it something on the horse's halter, but see the halters come off. So now we're on the, the, um, the, the, the temporary. You can braid something into their mane or tail. Um, I've seen people take a, like a Sharpie and write numbers on their hooves. That's what I was going to say, but I didn't know if that was. No, <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. And I've also seen the uh, livestock crayon or the paint stick. Mm -hmm. You put it on like the body of the horse. I've even seen clipping the hair. Here's, and here's, here's your tip of the day. Don't put your phone number. Put a phone number for someone out of the area because your mm -hmm. phone might not be working. So if someone finds a horse, they call the number that's on the horse. It doesn't get you because your phone's down, the satellite's down, the, you know. 
Got it. So have a backup person. Have a, yeah, have a backup person. So lots more tips like this if you go to the websites we give you. I did have a friend also mention once it's a good idea to have like the local like firefighters and police come into your barn oh, and yes. like get yes. to meet your horses, get to see what your layout of your barn is have your horses be familiar with another person walking in in uniform and things Expe like that. Yeah, they're very scary with their uniforms. They yeah. make noises. They're, they don't look like people anymore. And so if one of those guys can load <laughs> your horse up, you're ready. You're even better. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's super, super helpful. Good. So question number two was submitted, uh, submitted by Cody on YouTube. And Cody wants to know, how long can you ride a mare who is pregnant? Oh. This was the first time we got this, and I think it's a really good question. Um, the the rule of thumb that seems to be out there in the industry, mm -hmm. there's not really, although you should involve your veterinarian, there's not really a hard and fast veterinary um, rule for this, but the industry seems to think that somewhere in the six to eight month realm is where you should maybe stop, stop or yeah. And, and we should probably back up and say the gestation period for horses is 11 months, around the 340 days. So um, about halfway through? A little, yeah, a little bit more than halfway you can go, but it sometimes it depends on the mare herself. Mm. She'll either tell you, I, I found one, uh, one quote, from, oh, the, the two mares I rode while prego told me to take a hike around seven months. <laughs> Very clearly said, I'm done. And it, it has to do with um, the hormones for, one thing but also just physically like mm. the saddle doesn't fit where it's supposed to anymore it's getting pushed up so that's uncomfortable um, they might be affected by weight and weight shifts and so they're losing their uh, balance and agility and and people talk about loss the ability to canter after mm. six or seven months or because well, having to round up and can't get the legs <laughs> you know but collection yeah. is gone bending I mean there's just it's not it's not um, not comfortable it's not doable anymore so it depends also on like what discipline you're doing it does what level of riding it does. you're doing yep um, I did find a couple of veterinary references one was during uh, the fifth and tenth months of pregnancy the mares are endocrinologically you didn't think I was gonna build this table happy that, morning on that one good job <laughs> susceptible to abortion owing to hormonal deficiencies what that means is in those months the source of the hormones that keep the horse pregnant switch mm. so that's not a time to stress the mare um, overheat the mare so traveling there's people who compete pregnant mares and I I had to think twice about that because it's not so much the physical exertion that mm. concerns me, it's that they're being exposed to other horses. Oh, uh, yeah, and that's a good point. You might have your mare vaccinated, let's hope, um, but you know, the other horses might not be, and, and exposing your pregnant mare to other horses of unknown status is a little, to me it's risky, but. Yeah, to your point, you don't know all what all the other horses you know, on the, at the show yeah, are so doing or there's not. There's ways to go to shows and not use a stall and, and have your own water, and. Um, not graze and not mingle and they reduce your uh, exposure, horses exposure, but I think it's uh, a decision that everybody has to make for themselves and, and what's more important to them um, in this mare's life at yeah. the time. So. so roughly six to eight months, but kind of listen to your horse and mm -hmm. kind of see where her performance level is mm -hmm. going and if you start to see some uh, dwindling performance, maybe it's time to Right. Yeah, and, and definitely keep your vet in the loop, and they might have specific recommendations for time and, and things to watch for. And, and I do know there was one one reference to it's probably not a good idea to get your mare overheated. So Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to work out that much anyway, <laughs> so I'd be like, day one, uh, do not. <laughs> <laughs> so on to question number three, which was submitted by Tina on the Ask the Vet form at smartpack.com slash questions. Tina was wondering, what is pigeon fever? From what I know, it's an infection, but what are the symptoms? Where does it come from? Thanks, P.S. I love the series. I think that's more towards you because this is my first time. But <laughs> and then the new voting thing didn't yes. happen. Yeah. So we had this a com <laughs> we had a community comment from YouTube okay. from Rosie Horsey Girl oh who said, "What the hey is pigeon fever?" Okay. <laughs> I have to say that made my day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what's interesting is when I was in vet school they mentioned there was like five minutes on pigeon fever. 
and they called it that California thing. And since I knew I was going to be practicing in California, I'm like, I will learn this for Boris, and then I will not. You're like, I'll take the rest of the I day off. I will unlearn it, and <laughs> so then I had to look it up just for this. Um, so the other names for it is um, dry land distemper, but the real name for it, because it's a bacterial infection, is Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis. Pigeon fever sounds a great way of also pigeon calling fever. it. <laughs> and you know why it's called pigeon fever? It's not because pigeons have anything to do with it. It's because the the bulk of the of the signs you see with this are abscesses hmm. under the skin, even in the muscles, in the pectoral area of the horse's chest. So they look like birds, pigeons that have that bigger chest. Do you know uh, what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Like, they, get, they get that. They get that look. Like up here, we have like the robins who have like the red chest too. Yeah, yes. Robin red rice, yes. exactly. Yes. Yep, yep. <laughs> so that's why it, it has the name. But it, what it comes from is it's not, um, it's it's an infection, but it's not contagious, and that you don't get it from horse to horse. You get it from uh, flies tend to carry it and spread it. It comes, it lives in the soil, oh. and the places that that are have it in the soil are hot and dry. So it now it's Hence the California. Yeah, now though it's moved. It's migrated uh, east, and it's in 25 states. It's in Mexico and Canada, and so all vets need to be aware of this condition. And, and when a horse owner sees chest swelling, there can be leg swelling. They can also have abscesses inside. Um, they should have the vet out to diagnose it because it could be this or it could be something else. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make sure it's not strangles which is highly contagious yeah. between horses and would, would warrant a, a, a shutdown, an isolation, quarantine type thing. Um, this, not so much, but, but you, when it gets drained or it drains itself, the, rupture, the abscess is rupture, you want to make sure that they don't rupture in a place where another horse could pick them up. So there is some prevention of disease with it. So where it lives in the soil, Yes. and you have multiple horses on a property, out grazing, all of that, is every horse on the property susceptible to it, or are there some that are more prone to it than others? Um, I don't know if we know why horses get it. Um, it it's spread by flies. I would think an open wound would make you more susceptible, but okay. that's just common sense. But because it's not spread by um, horses, like for horse to horse, but by flies, then fly control measures are appropriate. So that's why I said these here, the Simplify, the Solitude, the, the feed through fly controls, but anything, fly spray, uh, premise spray, um, fans, my favorite, the cool curtains, anything you can do to cut down on the amount of flies on your property will limit the horses that get it. Okay. So that's probably the number one thing you can do. Got it. Yeah. That's super helpful. Yeah. And we all want to get rid of those flies. <laughs> <laughs> Another reason. Another reason, flies, too. Yeah. So we're moving on to question number four, which was submitted by Zoe on YouTube. YouTubers were crushing with the questions this time. What are summer sores, and why do horses get them? I noticed that some horses get them and others don't. How would you treat them? Okay. We did have a question from uh, on the community comment from that chestnut thoroughbred <laughs> who said, it's summer, why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not sure what that means, but all right. So um, summer sores, also called fly sores, the, um, the scientific name, are you ready? Mm -hmm. This is just the episode of the long names. <laughs> this is cutaneous heteronomiasis. Thank you for not Bless asking me, me to say any of these names, but you're, <laughs> you're nailing it. <laughs> um, so it's, it's an interruption in the life cycle of a horse's internal parasite, the stomach worm, hypernema. And what happens is it gets passed out and picked up by flies, and that's all good and proper. But instead of the flies depositing the larva on the mouth of the horse and then it being swallowed and starting the cycle over again. You didn't flinch at all. I thought you were going to make No. <laughs> okay. Um, the flies deposit the larva on like an open wound or some moist, warm place in the horse's body, mm. the, um, the corners of the eyes, and uh, like there's, if there's an injury or a scrape or something, the, the prep use or sheath. And then there's an allergic component where the horse is like, that ain't right. And then they their body reacts to this misplaced parasitic larva, yep. in a place where it's not supposed to be, 
and um, there, it gets to be a sort of an ulcerative, draining, open nodule. It's, it's quite nasty. Yeah, it does not sound like no, fun. It's, no, it's nasty. <laughs> some are sore. Um, so why do some horses get it and some don't? Probably has to do with your immune system. Mm. You know, how, it's because you can either underreact and, and not do anything and then you get it. You have some sort of sign. Or you overreact and then it's bigger than it needs to be because your body is like, that's not supposed to be there. I'm going to do, I'm going to throw everything at it. Try to fight the hardest yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. So I think it probably has to do with the immune system. Um, so the treatment is you, you want to give them ivermectin to kill the, the parasite itself, mm -hmm. you know, knock that out. And get then to the root cause of it. Get to the root cause. And then you might need to give some, some steroids to calm everything down and say, everybody go home, relax, nothing to see here. And then um, some antibiotics for the secondary bacterial infection, because if you have a big open draining something, then the bacteria yeah. probably went in there. Um, and again, fly control is a, a, huge, a huge part of this. A and, and giving ivermectin once a year. Which is one of your, these are like some of your favorite topics. I see how I sneaked into that, <laughs> parasite control. If we can get door. parasite control in there and, and anywhere. Poop, and poop. yeah, yeah, so good topic. That's super helpful. So would you say like horses who have more of like a compromise, like senior horses, you're going to see more of this in? No, or? Not, not, I can't say that. That has not been shown. But um, I, I think probably, you know, we, we have horses when we do fecals on them and we get the high shedders and the low shedders. Who knows why they... They do it, so I don't think you can look at a horse and tell his immune system is it, if it's like overpowering or it's sort of, you know, subtle. That's super helpful because I know uh, I'm on the customer care team here at Smart Pack, oh. so we get lots of customers oh. who call in with yeah. that, and it's it's hard because you have to like just talk to your vet and they want yeah. some like yeah easy cure for it. So yeah, and that's good advice too. Is, is your vet has to be included in this because one they have to diagnose it. It can look like it can look like other things. It can look like um, proud flesh. It can look like a, a sarcoma or sarcoid. So, so you definitely you, want to rule those things yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, you've got to diagnose those because those will have different treatments and prevention. So get it diagnosed, and then you'll be treating it appropriately. Um, and, that, of course, the vet has to be involved in the treatment. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so our final question was again submitted by a YouTuber, Jessica. Uh, so this summer, my horse has gotten like 25 little white spots, that di diameter of a pea, oh. all over his body. He's gotten a few of these in the past, but never so many. He's a sorrel horse, so this seems unusual. The spots have no pattern and don't show up anywhere in particular. What could be causing these to appear? Yeah, these are really interesting. Um, Oh, wait, we, I, have well, to, I, ha I have to read this community comment because it's great. <laughs> so this is from Brooklyn Howell who said, I've always wondered why my horse has random little white polka dots. Oh, <laughs> random little white polka dots. So That's a cute way of looking at they, it. Yeah, they have a name. They're called bird catcher spots. Bird catcher spots? Bird catcher spots. And it's, it's not bird poop spots, <laughs> bird catcher spots, because bird catcher was a thoroughbred back in the 1800s, a racehorse, that got these and they didn't know what they were. And ever after, any horse that looks like him, they're now referred to as bird catcher spots. Interesting. Yeah. And um, <laughs> nobody knows what they are. And they come and they go. So once your horse has them, you may not have them next year. They don't necessarily progress, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. They don't get bigger or more of them. They could get smaller or less of them, go away. Um, they can appear in a different spot next year. So just because they were in one place, um, they might, when your horse you know, sheds out, yep. they might be in that place next year. They might be in a different place. Um, they don't seem to cause any problems, so it's not an active area of research. So we're probably not going to find out more about these. The only thing I can say about them, because we sound completely clueless yeah. about these, right? <laughs> these white spots, is um, they do seem more prevalent in brown and chest on horses. They do seem more prevalent in thoroughbreds and Arabs. And that would lend you to believe that there is a genetic or inherited component mm. to this. But as I, again, as I said, nobody is studying it, so we. Cause there's no more, rhyme or reason to yeah, it Yeah, right. There's more important things. So for now, we just call them, oh, your horse has bird catcher spots. 
so that's kind of fun. Like every year the pattern changes. You have like a new color you horse have, every year. You have no idea. Yeah. Before we filmed, I was telling uh, Dr. Gray about how I rode an Appaloosa when I was in high school, who was a solid chestnut, and the same thing would happen to her every summer. Oh. She'd get little white spots. But I just blamed on her all being an Appaloosa. The, all over the body or just on the hind quarters? The hind quarters. And then, so I assumed it was just like, because yeah. uh, she's an Appaloosa. Yeah. But then the next year yeah. she'd get a couple more. So mm. now I know. know. Bird catcher. Know if those are bird catcher because the bird catchers can be anywhere in the body, like from head to toe. And nose they're just like little. Tail. Yeah, they're they're tiny. They're like the end of your finger, big. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Someone's got to start studying it. <laughs> we need photos. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you guys for just taking the time to submit all of your questions. And the comments, the community the comments. The comments were awesome. Fun. Keep yeah. those coming. Those were great. I definitely appreciated those. So now it is time to submit your questions for the November episode, which you can do on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, our blog, Twitter, or on our forum at smartpack.com slash askthevetquestions. Of course, you're going to ask your questions anytime with hashtag askthevetvideo. Any questions received before Friday, September 28th will be eligible for our next episode. Yay. Then make sure to vote on YouTube, Twitter, and our blog. Of course, if you had a question that was answered in this video or in a previous video, mm -hmm. make sure to reach out to our customer care team at customercare at smartpack.com to claim your gift card. Yeah. Holidays are right around the corner, so you guys are going to want to get those. Good idea. And you might get down on the phone. Yes, absolutely. Oh. Call, get me, I'll get your gift card. <laughs> So until next time, thanks guys. Make sure to subscribe and have a great ride.